Greetings, future fossils. This is Michael Garfield welcoming you to another edition of the podcast that explores our place in time. And oh my God, do we have a good one today. I am really, really excited that I managed to get Australian astrobiologist Tara Jokic on the show for this one. She was part of the team that discovered the oldest fossils known to science. Windows into the origins of life on Earth, where we came from, where we're going, the big questions. We dork out really, really hard in this episode, so I hope you're excited about science and learning and discovery and the mystical wonders of doing field research out in the Badlands. I cannot believe it took 34 episodes to get an actual geologist on this show, but folks, you're about to have your minds opened wide. But before we get started, a quick thank you to all of my Patreon subscribers, the folks who support this show with a small monthly donation, giving up one precious cup of coffee a month in order to crowd sponsor deep conversations. Yes, I love you. I really do. I'm so grateful to all of you. If you go to patreon.com slash Michael Garfield, I have a ton of writing and music and art and other things there for free for your enjoyment and if you stick around and you decide that you want to make my life a little easier then you can do that there as well and i thank you for it but do not let me forget to thank all of you who have rated and reviewed this show on itunes it's a huge help to the discoverability of it And the more people we can entertain and educate with this, the easier it will be for me to attract high-profile guests. So much, much, much appreciated. This is still an entirely listener-supported podcast, but I do want to give a shout-out again this week to my friends at Visionary Magnets. My buddies in Asheville I met on the festival scene a few years ago just started making this refrigerator magnet set that is hilarious and if you are the kind of person who appreciates a good-natured ribbing of new age crystal hippie silliness then i highly recommend you pick up one of these kits you can get one at bit.ly slash quantum avocado support their kickstarter these magnetic poetry kits let you say things that were formerly impossible with all previous magnetic poetry kits including the following short poem I wrote the other day, dedicated to the founder of holotropic breathwork techniques and the psychologist responsible for elucidating the four basic perinatal matrices of birth trauma, Stanislav Grof. Apocalyptic breathwork ceremony. Inhale and awaken. Exhale and dissolve. Go retrograde into the void and journey through your mother's mystic yoni channel deep within to shift your karma into the fluid matrix, transformational and moist, absorbed by the unlimited, where past and future present a primordial organic portal to rebirth into, radiating life most absolutely. (laughs) Okay, thanks for indulging me. Uh, That's bit.ly. L-Y slash quantum avocado if you want to pick up one of their kits and then a, a piece of their sales goes to supporting the multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies and they also plant a tree for every one of those that you pick up so you're helping anyway speaking of rebirthing through the organic portals let's get into this episode with the amazing University of New South Wales astrobiologist Tara Jokic. Everybody give it up. Awesome. I'm super glad that you took the time to sit with me on this. What time is it right now in Sydney? It's reasonable. It's 10 a.m. Oh, okay. Um, Okay. 
And uh, truth be told, I only got up like 20 minutes ago, so. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, well, this is, a, I like talking about deep time and uh, planetary issues while I'm trying to do the math in my head about, okay, it's 7 p.m. here, and I've been up for this long, and, you know, we're starting to establish that sort of spherical sense of our, our like, self as a, as a species, as a planet. So right, right, I, right. We were just talking about you, you're like going to, trying to explain what you do for a living to your dentist and like going to parties and stuff. So like, please continue with that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I guess, um, yeah, recently I went to a dentist, uh, for the first time and he, um, I'd actually changed dentists cause the last dentist I went to was a bit crazy. Anyway, he asked me what I did and I was like, oh, you know, I do this. And I used to be a bit shy about sort of talking about it, but I have kind of got to a point where I'm like, well, you know, if somebody asks and they're interested, I'm going to, you know, give it a crack just to kind of nutshell it. And he was like, by the end of it, he's like, yeah, you know, thanks a lot for actually explaining that to me. That's really cool. I'm glad the last dentist you saw um, was crazy because now I've got an interesting client. Um, (laughs) So, which was nice, but like, you know, just talking about this kind of stuff in like the public sphere sometimes, and especially like I was saying earlier, you know, I'm 30 years old, I still go to parties and stuff. And it's not really a topic that like, you feel fits into conversation, you know, people are joking, and they're talking about this sport, and they're talking about, you know, like, funny things that happened and politics and stuff like the things that are happening around us. Um, And I mean, it is surprising that how interested people are, but it does very quickly kind of like fizzle out um, because it kind of gets to a point where people just, you know, don't really know what other questions necessarily <laughs> to ask. Um, and yeah, like, I mean, how do you, you know, how do you do that? You don't, and you don't want to like take over a conversation. You don't want to like push your, what you do on other people, but it's like, how do you, how do you balance that? How do you bring in these big topics, you know, and know when to actually kind of like push and give information or pull back and sort of just, let things be do you know what i mean (laughs) can we talk about the most profound and terrifying mystery at the that we just sort of pave over with entertainment yeah we're just this (laughs) tiny little dot floating in a gigantic universe but you know like who cares because we you know care more about like what we're gonna have for dinner um i'm hungry i'm hungry now it's really cool what you're talking about but my stomach's telling me i'm hungry so i'm gonna go eat um, and, and that's just kind of the reality of the situation sometimes. That's why I find this stuff is actually, it's, it's pretty good to talk about this stuff at festivals because usually everyone is fairly well fed and sufficiently <laughs> entertained. You know, they've kind of gotten to the, they've worked their way up Maslow's hierarchy to, you know, entitled upper middle class level. And they're actually willing to indulge you going on for an hour and a half about, the profundities of the cosmos, you know. Well, and, and I guess they're going into it knowing that that's what is going to be talked about as well, right? Like, um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, you go oh, when yeah. you go when you go somewhere and you know, like, okay, there's a speaker that's going to be talking about this. You're going because you're interested and you want to hear about it. So that makes it a little bit easier, and it's good. I mean, it's it's. Um, I do like that. I like that. You know, people like yourself and. Um, Bruce get involved in in stuff like that where it's kind of like getting to a, 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 a maybe an audience that doesn't necessarily get tapped into by you know like the cliche lab coat scientists who sort of stay within their own circles which is a bit of a shame but yeah yeah I mean it's it's incredible like I said I was I was getting my hair cut today and I was telling the guy cutting my hair about your research and how excited I was to talk to you and I think it's f- safe to say that that anyone listening to this episode chose to because they know that we're going to get into the origins of life and your paleontological work in Western Australia. So like, maybe we shouldn't dally on this too much, but (laughs) but (laughs) it is, but it is, it is this, this thing about um, if you hit it at the right angle, if you get in there at the right moment, then I think most people don't even realize how curious they are about this stuff. Mm. You know, it's like, we're not even, for the most part, we're not even really given an, an opportunity. You know, our lives are too busy and, and everything's too frantic and there's too many, you know, the, the manufactured urgency of modern life is so loud and intense that right. it really does take 
you know, I was I was thinking about who was I was talking about recently about scholastic. The word scholar is related mm. to the Greek root for leisure, and it's like you yeah. really you really have to have oh totally a certain oh, amount of free I mean, time for this. Oh, exactly. And yeah, recently I was thinking about it because um, I like I want to write a book one day about a sort of astrobiology and philosophy. And, you know, the, the reason why we're able to answer questions is because, yes, we are given the time to actually do that. So, like, the way I see it, it's either, you know, we're um, limited by either means, so, you know, like money um, and time, or minds, and that means education. So, like, you can't you necessarily have the potential even have these conversations if someone's talking to you in a geology language or a chemistry language or something like that, you know, it's alienating. So, um, you know, so yeah, we are, we, we actually are in a time, certainly in like Australia, at least, um, I can speak for that. We do, we do, we can make the time to have conversations about like this and think about it. Um, but, but we also clutter our lives with so much stuff and we're living in this technologically, digital world where we're completely bombarded and distracted constantly. Um, so it really is to me about means or minds. So, yeah, I mean, and these questions, when you really do sit down and start to think about them, like they do shape the way you look at the world. They do change the way that you, your perspective on the world. So in honor of the original, or like the et- etymological origin of education which is ex ducere to lead out let's lead people out of huh. our busy modern world and into the hadean into the early earth you know we can we can take a detour into your own history and how you got into this work which is just the coolest work i think but Yeah. So like, how did you get into astrobiology and the study of the origins of life? And then what have you discovered? Because some of the the work that I found out about you, again, through Bruce Damer's stuff, and and Bruce was sharing some really incredible fossil discoveries that you and your your colleagues have made recently. So wherever you want to pick up on that, however you want to weave, you know, the backwards narrative. Uh, well, just in a nutshell, because it is kind of a long story, but like I've always been interested. Um, when I was a kid, I used to look up at the stars and think, what else is out there? That's just like an innate sense in me. Um, uh, and it wasn't really until I was in my early 20s that I had an opportunity to go and study at university. I didn't finish high school properly, so I didn't have the option to do that when I first left high school. And, you know, I, I just struggled to kind of, I did a bunch of odd jobs. And I just struggled to find anything that really, like, made me, like, challenged me. And so when I had this opportunity to go to university, I was, like, I was looking at medicine, I was looking at doing business, and I was looking at doing astronomy. And I thought, oh, you know, astronomy, it's, like, it's a bit of, no, it's, you know, like, you know, all these kind of realistic questions. I thought, fuck it, like, sorry. I thought, why not? Like, why not go and study something that is interesting, that I think is interesting and worthwhile knowing about because it gives you a perspective potentially, like this is the way I saw it, it gives you a perspective on the world that doesn't encase you in a bubble because when you have like, you you know, we have relationships with people and like the same, you know, you always have, you have friends and then you have fights and then you get over it and then you have relationships and you have breakups and all this and all that sort of stuff just is is like the same, right? Like it's a cyclic pattern that you kind of know how it's going to go down. But learning about the world you live in, I was like, wow, like, you know, there's so many unanswered questions. Um, so I ended up getting in, I actually ended up getting in doing a science degree, um, starting off in astronomy, hadn't picked up a maths book in about five years and failed my first subject of maths and thought, you know, like clearly I can't do astronomy and astrophysics without being able to do mathematics, um, a high level of mathematics. So I decided, um, why not study the planet that I'm standing on? And then I I ended up doing geology. And it wasn't until my second year that I found out about the field of astrobiology. And that made sense to me because it was kind of like, well, yeah, this brings back into the, you know, into my picture, this astronomical perspective. Um, And astrobiology is essentially, you know, the search for life elsewhere. Um, What are our origins and what's the future, you know, the destiny potentially of of life in in the universe being us, uh, us moving forward. 
and that made sense to me. So I could come at it from a, a geology perspective, which I understood, um, and bring something into like an an astronomical world by using what I understand about Earth and then taking that, I mean, obviously in what we're doing now, which is our closest uh, neighbour and most similar planet, Mars, and taking what we know about here on Earth, um, life and all that kind of thing, and then potentially looking for those signs on Mars. And that that was full circle for me. You know, I was able to pursue astrobiology and and sort of pursue those little questions I had as a kid, looking up at the stars, going, what else is out there? So it might be a little too early in this call to ask you what you think of Fermi's paradox and the issue of the great silence that confounds astrobiological efforts to connect with something else out there. But, uh, cause I mean, you're kind of on the other end of it, right? Like you're, you know, the origins of life research and exploring, you know, the bacterial end of things is a very, very far cry from getting into SETI type work. But I mean, totally. nonetheless, I'm, I'm curious what you think is, is going on here. <laughs> What, in terms of, is there life out there? Or? In terms of, yeah, in terms of the likelihood of life. Because, I mean, I, th- I, I th- again, we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but, like, the work that you're involved with would suggest that life is actually very, very common out there. And so it, it, it just makes the question of why we don't seem to be finding other civilizations even more irritating. Yeah. Well, I guess the yeah, I guess um, the Drake equation comes into this, which is obviously taking into account you know probability in terms of a uh, sample of how much life there is out there that we know of, um, you know, and all the the how many planets there mu- must be, and how many solar systems, how many galaxies, etc. And so obviously you're talking about the Fermi's paradox and that being a bit of a contradiction. If the probability is so high, then why hasn't anybody contacted us? Um, but if you really think about it, like life on Earth. Um, so certainly intelligent life on Earth, um, us, have only been really civilized and able to uh, create technology that is even partly advanced enough to even get to places like Mars. And that's taken, what, a uh, couple hundred thousand years to get to this point, and we've only really been technologically advanced for a couple thousand years, and most of that was quite primitive. You know, and, like, with the – I don't want to, like – um, go down a negative route here because I I'm a I'm a glass half full kind of person, <laughs> but um, but you know people and I hate to say it but people like Trump getting in power and all these kind of like people that have lack insight in terms of in terms of you know thinking for humanity uh, moving forward and you know prospering as a community as a global community um, a lot of people a lot of people in power aren't thinking that way so there is a high chance that we will probably extinguish ourselves um, before we get to a point where we're actually exploring further than our solar system. And that's probably partly a reality of the situation in terms of why maybe, you know, other civilized species or technologically advanced species haven't contacted us because maybe just they extinguish themselves before they get a chance. Um, like I said, I'm a glass half full kind of person and and maybe that's not necessarily going to happen to us, but, um, but those are the kinds of things we can only base what we know about life and intelligent life on what we have here on earth, because we've got no other sample. And until that happens, I guess we can only sort of make hypothesis, which is what science does. Mm. For me, one of the things that I love about the astrobiology as a field and sort of as a, as a frame or lens through which we examine things is that it seems uniquely open to challenging its own assumptions. Like so many fields out there are a little bit more bound by their own orthodoxy, whereas it's right there on the front. It's like in the mission statement of, of astrobiological research that we don't know what life is. We don't know what it looks like. We're going to continue to challenge our expectations. We're going to continue to, to cast our net wider and wider and to, to 
play with our definitions and our assumptions. And so in light of that, I guess, you know, one of the things that I'm always reflecting on is that maybe, maybe we're surrounded by civilizations that we don't even recognize them because they're so sophisticated that it doesn't qualify for us. But at any rate, or like it, like a different dimension or something like that, maybe, or yeah. Yeah. Or like, you know, I th- it was Edward Snowden and Neil deGrasse Tyson had a conversation about this and they said, uh, Snowden suggested that maybe we get to a point in, in every civilization where cryptography becomes so important that all communication becomes encrypted. And so for us on earth, we're looking at a message, a signal that's been sent from one super intelligent alien to another and it looks like noise it looks like just random radiation to us and so he he was kind of suggesting you know maybe the maybe the in the sense that you know mathematically randomness is just an it's an inability to perceive a pattern we don't detect it and so it's like how much of this uh, alleged cosmic background radiation is actually like alien porn going back and forth you know <laughs> yeah well hey the, it, there's, i don't think there's anything that's completely we can rule out to be honest uh we we just don't we just don't know do we like i, I mean that's what the great thing about science is until you can like you've got to like falsify things and um you know i think that I, I think there's two kinds of scientists and bruce actually is a type of scientist that is he you know he comes up with concepts and then he builds on that, you know, this is sort of like, I feel tradition, well, partly traditional science, you come up with a hypothesis, and then you test it. But like, in our field in geology, we we do the opposite, we go and collect information, we go collect rocks, and then we try and build a story around that, right? So it's it's kind of the, the to me, I see it as being the opposite. And it's kind of like, you know, um, I love what Bruce does in that sense, because you can sort of think, of, you know, you are just thinking outside the box. And until like, someone says it's right or, or someone finds evidence that it's right or wrong. Um, I, I don't actually think we can completely rule it out, to be honest. I mean, think about it 500 years ago or whenever it was before Copernicus um, and Galileo. We thought, you know, we had the Ptolemaic system where we were the center of the solar system. And then people were like, hang, hang on a second, maybe we're not, uh, you know, and then they built on that hypothesis and built evidence. And then, you know, guess what? We're actually not the center of the solar system. <laughs> <laughs> it's like in another 500 years people are going to look back on this and be like god remember when they had the facebook cosmology where everyone thought that they were the center of their own news feed <laughs> <laughs> like, that's so true oh gosh i'm looking forward to the day facebook disappears to be honest <laughs> oh yeah can, we, can, can we can we myspace it soon enough but, so so i one of the reasons is like okay let's ground this a little bit one of the reasons that i was really excited to talk to you is that you're one of the only other people I know my age who has done paleontological field work. And although this context, although, you know, the ancient, ancient world, like some of the oldest rocks in the world out in Western Australia, it's a very different context than working with dinosaur quarries in Wyoming. I feel like you and I have a sort of mutual understanding here and I, I would love to there's something about specifically about getting out into nature into these these wilderness areas where the rocks are the right age and are exposed and it's so often you know very inhospitable climates because that's that you know nothing is growing there and that's why you're able to do the work and then you're mm-hmm. out there and you're working in the earth and you're under the sun and the big sky and it induces uh, like an almost, I feel like an altered state of consciousness to be out in that space that is actually really conducive to the kind of geological time reverie that is such an inspiration for this conversation in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, Just like, just you get out into the, into the badlands of wherever and then you're just thinking about the passage of unfathomable spans of time. And I'm curious uh, to hear a little bit about the work that actually led to these fossils and what you found and why it's such a yep. big deal and, and what we're learning and all of that. Sure. So, uh, so the, the 
geological formation, I'll just start from scratch. In Western Australia, it's set in the Pilbara, uh, which is about 150 kilometres inland um, of Port Hedland, this location called the Dresser Formation. And so there has been known stromatolites there since the late 1970s. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. And it, We're doing it again. Stromatolites are... Oh, right, okay. <laughs> So stromatolites are basically rock structures built by communities of microorganisms. And and these ancient ones, these fossil ones, don't have any cellular material left. It's just the rock structure. And a good analogy for that, which everyone seems to like, um, is if you were to come to Earth and find apartment buildings and find houses and all that kind of stuff and not find humans, at least you would know that humans were once there. And it's kind of the same thing. So, um, so in the late 1970s, uh, they discovered stromatolites, these communities, these rock structures built by communities of microorganisms um, in the Dresser Formation. And it wasn't, I don't think it was till a little bit later that they were managed to really properly date the, the rocks, but they did do a pretty good job in terms of a rough, rough estimate, these rocks being three and a half billion years old. Um, so these are essentially the oldest evidence of life, um, oldest convincing evidence of life on the planet at the time. And anyway, I come along 40 years later or whatever. Um, and since then the, the model of the environment has actually changed. So originally it was interpreted as a, a shark bay type environment. So we're talking a shallow water marine quiet sort of environment, right? On a coast, you've got a semi-enclosed basin, it's quite salty water in this semi-enclosed basin. That's why stromatolites live there today in Shark Bay. Um, over the last 15... It's because they can't be eaten by snails, right? That's Yeah, yeah, it's a bit like that. I mean, it's funny because Shark Bay is quite diverse in terms of having life. There's not, It's not just stromatolites there, and there are sharks, of course, because it's called Shark Bay. Um, but, um, it just seems to be the perfect, like the, the absolute perfect conditions for them. Um, and they are, yes, sheltered, uh, by, you know, a lot of, um, other marine life, I suppose. But like, there's still, it's funny cause there is still other sort of marine life from there that I guess could potentially eat them. And that's why we don't have stromatolites all over the planet because they get eaten by grazers, right? Things that eat up the little, you know, it's a part of the whole sort of circle of life. They eat up the, the microorganisms that's at the bottom of the food chain. But in Shark Bay, it is perfect conditions and, you know, they just thrive there. I think in the Caribbean, there's also some stromatolites as well. So basically, uh, yeah, so you had this model of the dresser formation as being a quiet, shallow water marine environment. And um, about uh, probably in the late 90s, I think it was 1998, the paper came out that looked at essentially there are these um i'm going to do my best to describe this there are these big veins these big what we call hydrothermal veins they basically represent hot circulating fluid beneath the surface and these big veins cut up through the underlying rocks underneath the the sedimentary units that contain the fossils and these veins cut up through those underlying units and then disperse into the sedimentary units but originally, they were discounted. They were said, no, nope, these things came in later. So they were completely taken out of the model, right? So they said, okay, we've got sedimentary units, we've got shallow water sediments, we've got stromatolites, must be a shark bay type setting. These hydrothermal veins, not part of the story. But in 1998, 99, this paper came out that said, actually, these hydrothermal veins are part of the story. And a reconsideration of the model um, should be you know, put forward. And it took about um, only probably about 10 years. And then my supervisor sort of developed this model and showed that, yes, these hydrothermal veins, so these representation of these hot circulating fluids were part of this system. And it was potentially an ancient volcano, right? So that's completely different to what was originally interpreted. And so anyway, fast forward to 2013, and what had not really been shown by the time that I came along, um, so in 2013, I started a master's at the University of New South Wales in geology. And what had not been shown for the dresser formation is actually surface deposits of these large subsurface hydrothermal veins. And by surface deposits, I mean hot springs. So you saw the sedimentary units, you saw the, you know, you saw ripples and sandstone and all this kind of thing, um, and the fossils. 
You saw these underlying, these subsurface large hydrothermal veins, but you didn't actually see any kind of like sinter deposits or geyserite, anything that alluded to hot spring pools, like these sur- basically the surface manifestations of this large hydrothermal system, which is essentially um, created by a volcanic environment. And a good example of that is Yellowstone National Park. So you've got, you know, a huge super volcano and the heat from all of the um, volcanic activity heats up the groundwater and you end up with hot springs. And around those hot springs, you get um, essentially what, what umbrella term, hot spring deposits. And these hot spring deposits include sinter and geyserite and a whole bunch of, you get microbial mats and uh, basically a whole bunch of microbial communities growing around those hot springs. And a good example of that is the Champagne Hot Springs where you've got this beautiful large pool and these brilliant, you know, rainbow colors that kind of like grade away from the pool. And that's all microbes. And so that hadn't been really shown for the dresser formation. And that's kind of like the cherry on top of the cake in terms of building this volcanic model that has, you know, subsurface hydrothermal fluid circulation, but then also hot springs. And the key here really is linking the hot springs and life. And that's really what my work pursued to do. Now, fast forward. So in 2013, um, you know, I did about a month of field work and I went out and collected samples and I mapped. So I walked, you know, I, I actually foot on ground, walked across these rocks taking down observations on pen and paper and collected samples so that I could understand where do these samples fit into context and and start to sort of build a picture. And it took about, I mean, this. so we obviously had a paper come out this year that, guess what, we found geyserite. And geyserite is this, um, as I was talking about before, it's a a smoking gun essentially for a a hot spring uh, setting. And it took us four years to really develop, you know, and, and interpret the, the samples that I had found, uh, which is why I sort of did the mapping in 2013 and 2014. And it wasn't until this year that we actually were able to publish on it because we were building the story around it. And we were actually having to, you know, uh, build a case and go, OK, yes, we have this rock, which we think is geyserite, but how do we prove it? Right. So that's kind of like in, I guess, in a a nutshell, the piece that the, yeah, the uh, crux of the work is this this sample called geyserite, which we were able to discover in the dresser formation, which, you know, adds to that model of a volcanic system and hot springs. But also with that geyserite, we found signs of life. So this is a big deal because, as I understand it, one of the big implications of this is that the competing model, the competing narrative for the origins of life for decades has been that it happened around a hydrothermal vent in the ocean, that that it was this kind of revelation that people thought, you know, originally the idea had been, you know, the, the early origins, we thought, oh yeah, it's like a, it must have happened somewhere in a warm, shallow pond somewhere near the water. And then Years ago, people said that there's there are these uh, ionic gradients and all of this heat and activity around the hydrothermal vents, and so that's you know maybe that's where it came from because this was like riding on the back of those deep sea submersible discoveries that there's actually a very rich chemosynthetic ecosystems down there, but it doesn't makes sense when you consider that water is the universal solvent and actually it's a very difficult environment for very fragile tenuous organic chemistry to happen and that if you really want massive chemical computation in which you can start allowing these complex organic molecules like RNA to start coming together, then it's actually a much better environment in these kinds of hot spring areas. And so it's pushing the dominant narrative back in the direction of like life started in a like a jacuzzi type right, situation, right, right. which is again, like it's a big deal because if we walk the wrong path in our origin story, then we're crippling ourselves theoretically. Like we're, we're, there are reasons why it has taken us so long to reproduce these 
settings in a laboratory and why it's taken us why it's been so difficult to create something like early life in a lab and it, it, it seems like with the right story in place that suddenly we'll we're so much closer to actually being able to create the conditions under which life can spontaneously occur in a laboratory environment which I don't know if that's like the main thing that you're excited about, but I mean, <laughs> well, I know that's what Bruce, Bruce is excited about. Um, I mean, that that's not, well, the thing is like, I come from a geological perspective, right? So, you know, as you said, like, and this isn't, my field isn't, you know, biochemistry and in terms of um, like all the in, in, interactions that the chemical interactions that go in, in these two types of environment. Um, and, and at the same time, like I like to keep an open mind. like, what if life started in both places? You know, who knows? We haven't proven one yet, but the evidence is pointing towards hot springs. From what I understand, and from Bruce Damer's work, Bruce and Dave Deemer, the ocean, yeah, is a bit of an inhospitable environment. It's salty, which is actually for, you know, complex molecules to um, evolve. And, it, you know, they're fragile as well early on, I, su- I suspect. Um, for a salty ocean, that's a harsh environment. Um, but the key as well is that it, it that to concentrate these polymers, you need wet dry cycles, which is something that you can't get in a subaqueous environment, right? An environment that's always wet. But you can get it on land in hot springs where you get essentially, you know, these these hot pools that are drying down and then refilling with water and drying down and refilling with water. And so like if you get – and the way that Bruce puts it, if you – think of like a bathtub you know that soapy sort of ring around the bathtub that kind of like crusts over time that's exactly sort of what's happening in these hot springs potentially and concentrating these polymers they then get ripped up again and sort of go back into the mix and then concentrate again as this you know wet dry cycle goes through and then you've got a whole bunch of these you know hot spring pools all around and so all the different types of chemical reactions that can be going on start to sort of proliferate and uh, will jump from pool to pool essentially potentially as well right so you can have like a bucket load of different chemical reactions going on in these pools and my supervisor likes to, I think he likes to use the term um, pools of fitness right so you've got all these different pools of fitness and and then they all sort of like interact with one another so on like a on a primitive prebiotic before biology perspective you've got maybe evolution occurring in terms of these different pools of fitness that are sort of uh, flowing into one another and mixing and concentrating and becoming more complex. Um, so yes, in term, from, a, from a biochemical or biochemist perspective, it does seem to point more towards uh, that, that hot springs are more viable environments for all of these types of reactions to occur. And I believe there's a few other things um, that come into play here that I just, I cannot remember the details of, but what I can say from a geological perspective is that prior to our work and finding that, yes, there are hot springs in three and a half billion year old rocks on earth, the oldest evidence for hot springs was 400 million years ago. So we've extended so we've extended the, the record of inhabited hot springs on Earth um, by three billion years. And not only that, and the key here as well is that this is life on land. And prior to this work, um, the earliest evidence for life on land was at 2.7 billion years ago. And so that's ex- essentially extending a record of life on land by about 580 million years. Now, the, the key here, right, is that because they thought life, you know, okay, the oldest evidence of life on land is about 2.7 billion years. It means that life adapted to land late, right? You know, because we always have this sort of model that life started in the oceans, went onto the land, um, went onto the land, and then sort of went back into the oceans, right? But it's not really, not necessarily like that. It's now we're seeing a geological perspective saying that life on land was actually quite, you know, these environments were available very early on in Earth's history. And so that becomes a key in terms of adding to that pool of evidence that, you know, maybe these hot springs are a more viable option when you really, you know, put all these multiple lines of evidence together. And then, yeah, you know, you're talking about like bigger picture questions, then if we're going to go look for life elsewhere, um, you know, where if we're talking about Mars, one, if we find life preserved in ancient hot springs on Earth, 
uh, in three and a half billion year old deposits, hot spring deposits on Earth? Um, where are we going to look for life on Mars when a lot of the Martian surface is about the same age as early Earth? Well, we know they're preserved in hot springs here. Let's go look at fossil hot springs there, right? So it, it gives us a search strategy. And then two, if life started in hot springs as opposed to deep sea hydrothermal vents, um, when we think about places like Enceladus, where they're they're suggesting, okay, maybe life started, you know, at the bottom of its ocean um, with these hydrothermal vents and life could be there. Well, if it didn't start in these hydrothermal vents, then, then maybe we shouldn't be going to places like these icy moons of the, um, you know, these gaseous giants. Do you know what I mean? So it, it, it really, like, starts... It could save us a considerable sum of, of money. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, and save us, yeah, a couple of billion dollars. And again, you know, like I said, I like to stay open-minded. Um, you know, life could have started in both places. But, you know, science um, it is about mounting evidence. And for me, from what I've seen and from what I've, you know, heard in the research that I've done, there is mounting evidence that the possibility that life started in hot springs um, is quite high as opposed to hydrothermal vents. But that's just based on evidence <laughs> oh you know just only evidence <laughs> one of the things that i find you know because my connection with this research through bruce damer is largely about weaving the evidence together into a narrative into a mythology and so that we can re we can replace the pre-modern kind of religious mythologies with postmodern scientifically rigorous mythologies that nonetheless still maintain a holistic understanding of the cosmos and reveal or disclose to us our our place and our our interconnectedness our interbeing our embeddedness in this in this big thing you know that give the individual human life meaning within this bigger story you know, because that's that's what's missing from so much of the like the Enlightenment modernity view. It's a very cold and unwelcome place for a few hundred years in in the Western world in terms of where do we place ourselves in this? And like we went from being the, the ch God's chosen people to being basically of no importance at all, and now right. we're we're able to. It seems like with work like this, like I was at the the MAPS Psychedelic Science Conference in Oakland, California, a few months ago. And at the conference, I ran into David Bronner, who is the the uh, head of Dr. Bronner's Soaps, you know. And, and I, I got to tell him <laughs> this story. I got to say, man, you, your life and work and your dad's work have been completely vindicated by this new geological research that suggests two things. One, the origin of life was soap. And, and that this, this earliest life form, what they call the, the progenote, which is, you know, and this, this is something we haven't gotten into in the call yet, but it's really, I find really fascinating the, this notion that before the cell, we just had, you know, the, like maybe the RNA world of just self reproducing nucleic acids in a kind of soup of fluid identity. And so there wasn't, I mean, even among bacteria, they, they exchange bits of their genetic code rather freely compared to animals like you and I. But this ancient world was even more sort of genetically promiscuous. And so we were wrong to cast our gaze back in search of a first cell or a first, a first thing because life didn't start as an individual. Life started as an entire community. Yes. And so yeah, the, the Dr. I, I Bronner logo, like, we are one, you know, and their slogan, we are one. I was like, dude, your dad was completely right. We start like soap is the most important thing. And we are all one. It's, it's like right there in the latest scientific evidence for this. And when you can like cast the complexities of this research in simple terms like that, it really... I don't know. I don't know. I, I feel like it's it's shifted. It certainly shifted the way I clean my bathroom because now whenever I'm scraping soap scum off the tub, I'm like, am I destroying a future civilization? 
I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a fair call. Uh, I don't know. I look. I um. I think that. Yeah, we. You know, we all. If if everything that we have interpreted is correct, and by that I mean evolution and us coming from microbes, and you know, obviously, I believe in that. I believe in evolution. Um, it seems whoa, 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 whoa. logical. And Back up. <laughs> I should have pre-screened you. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, yeah, so I, you know, the, the evidence shows us in the geological record that, you know, we've come from more primitive forms of life and evolved into more complex forms of life. Now, I think that, uh, you know, killing the soap scum in your bathroom, is that going to be another civilization? Uh I don't know if I would worry about it. I mean, that's just all part of life, right? Um, but in terms of like, you know, in terms of giving us a perspective, um, I mean, for me at least, like I can only speak for me. And, you know, when I think, okay, well, we all just came from, you know, goo and maybe one day the universe won't be here anymore. I find that pretty humbling, um, you know, and that that's pretty much like the reason or one of the major reasons I got into this field because I like I said before you know relationships come and go friendships come and go you know life changes and evolves and all this kind of thing and the society we live in is so distracting and we get so caught up in like little things and trivial things and this that and the other and you know like uh, someone's upset on one side of the world because someone broke up with them you know, then someone else is living a different reality because they're living in pov- under the poverty line because of the government system there that, you know, isn't doing justice for its people. And I think when you kind of like put all of that into perspective um, and think, well, you know, we just kind of came from goo, it, it just sort of makes you a little <laughs> bit humbler. It makes you a little, like, I mean, that, like, yeah, like I said, I can only speak for myself. It, may, it makes me a little humbler um, because I do get caught up in the same stuff that everybody else does. You know, like we're humans, we are governed by our emotions and our biology, which is what we're talking about. Um, so if, if I can look outside of that biological box as a human being, just, you know, and put things into perspective, then I'm going to. And that's what I think astrobiology does. And then that's what I think, you know, um, studying origins of life does. It's like that famous quote. I think, it, I think it was Edgar Mitchell that said this, that the astronaut, and he said that the, his experience of going into space was that he just wanted to grab every politician in the world and bring them <laughs> up there and take them by the shoulders and make them look at Earth from orbit and say, look at that, you son of a bitch. You know, yeah. like, just, would you please just... Or, you know, like uh, my encounter, my first encounter with Joe Rogan's podcast was he had this rant about DMT and how DMT showed him that really nothing has changed on Earth, that we're still just like this layer of scum on the surface of it. Oh, totally. It's just, it's not really that (laughs) different. You know, you look, you look at, you know, like the stromatolites, I think about a lot about how the rules of the game even though it seems like the players have really changed over billions of years, the rules of life, the rules of the evolutionary process are the same. And so... Well, and did, did you know that in microbial communities, all of the same things that go on in terms of social interaction among humans also go in in microbial communities? So, like... Yeah, give me they an example. Will cheat, they will cheat to get ahead. So certain parts of, like, a microbial community will cheat to get ahead, so they'll cheat to get, you know, like... Um, metabolic uh, advancement <laughs> um, they you know some will sort of as soon as a niche becomes free they will take up the resources and fill in that niche um, you know and this is how and obviously the environment has a part to play on that but um, but the same types of what we would call social interactions between humans in terms of fighting for resources capitalizing where we see we can capitalize happens in microbial communities And they work together as a community. On top of that, there's a thing called quorum sensing. And they'll Mm -hmm. work together as a community where they basically send out a message where they all work together to achieve a certain goal. 
and human beings are basically doing the same sorts of things. And the best thing, I think the funniest thing about it is that they cheat to get ahead because I feel like that's what humans, or we know that that's what humans do as well. And so it's just kind of like, we're really just a macro sized version of a microbial community on the planet. Um, oh yeah. Like the, the stromatolite, I keep thinking about, you know, the work of, uh, do you know the architect Paolo Soleri? No. He was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright's and in the United States, in the middle of the 20th century, he started uh, designing these futuristic buildings called arcologies, which was the, the, the union of architecture and ecology. And so he was looking to the natural world and trying to design a building that would work as a single organism so that you could have people live and work in large populations in one space where everything was naturally heated and cooled. And it just made so much more sense than, you know, the sort of brutalist architecture of, of the, the modern era or the suburbs or any of this nonsense that's like so out of touch with the way that natural systems organize themselves. And Solari's blueprints for these hypothetical buildings, some of which were uh, investigated by the Chinese and Japanese and inspired a lot of these these new kind of urban design programs that are being deployed today, resemble nothing more than stromatolites. It's like 100,000 people living in one excreted calcium <laughs> edifice type. It's like, it's like, a, it's, it's, it's sort of a uh, you know, so you look at this stuff and you're like, we had apartment buildings three and a half billion years before we had people. It's, <laughs> uh, and what? You know, so it just. Yeah. Well, that, that brings to mind, I like, if you, if you really look at everything in life, everything's just like a bigger or smaller version of, of something else. Like look about, look at the atom, right? The atom's made up of protons and neutrons in its nucleus with electrons spinning around it. What takes on that shape? The solar system right? You've got your sun at the middle of the solar system and then you've got your planet spinning around it. And I just, I feel like wherever you look in nature and the same applies in biology, you're seeing the same patterns. Uh, you know, they're called fractal patterns, um, I think in paleontology. Um, but you just see the same patterns and I feel like it's kind of the, you know, it is, yeah, human beings are really just a, another form of microbial community, but just on a macro scale on this planet, because we're still tiny. And, you know, as you were saying before, like, um, this, uh, gentleman who used DMT and realized the clarity that we're still a bunch of sort of soap scum on the crusting on this planet is kind of true when you look at the scale of the universe. Yep. So... <laughs> So this is, oh man, I think, you know, so like scaling forward, I, I start wondering about not only, you, you know, what this research has to teach us in terms of where we might find life elsewhere, but also, you know, whether this has any bearing on, like I said, with like Solari's architectural work, you know, whether we're learning anything by looking back at the simplest, most elemental forms of life, like the earliest examples that we can find, if we're not learning something about the essence or, I mean, not to, there's like a whole thing about vitalism and life having an essence that I'm not actually, I'm not actually going there. Um, that, that life is a thing, you know, cause the, this is a detour, but like, you know, molecular biology sort of attacks this idea that, that there is such a thing as life at all. And it just renders everything in terms of like information patterns and kind of suggests that there isn't anything sort of qualitatively different between living systems and, un and non-living systems. So there's no Ilan Vital. But anyway, mm. um, the <laughs> <laughs> that's another podcast <laughs> entirely, entirely different. Yeah. But, but it does make you wonder whether there aren't key sets of characteristics that, can inspire and inform the ways that not only we look for life in the cosmos, but the ways that we can bring life forward. Like the, the kind of systems that we design for cities of the future or for space colonies, you know, like what are we, what are we learning here? And it seems like one of the big things that's coming out of this research again is this notion that, life has always been a network of genetic activity that it's not, it hasn't been, it didn't evolve in isolation. 
that's what I have drawn from this. And I'm curious what else, mm. or, you know, whether, you, whether that hits you the way that it hits me or, or what other yeah, kind of yeah, like deep does. insights you've, you've have well, precipitated out for you. Commu- I think, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of like network or community. Um, you know, if life started, okay, let's, let's like, um, let's say we're distinguishing life or biology from inorganic matter. Um, contrary to, you know, the discussion that you could probably have in another podcast that you just mentioned, which is a good discussion. (laughs) Yeah, might as well. Um, Because, because rocks do grow. (laughs) Um, So the crystals in volcanic rocks do grow. Um, Anyway, so basically um, I think that life's like life as we know, it started off as a community, right? It could not have proliferated and become more complex if it didn't work as a community. And so if you're going to take away, like, I don't know, take a message in terms of origins of life and understanding potentially, and actually that's a bold statement, you know, saying life started as a community. It see, it actually does seem that way, yes, especially with Bruce and Dave's work. But if you take, if you have a take-home message, certainly for from a human perspective, we're still a community today and we wouldn't be moving forward without being a community. But unfortunately for some reason, humans all seem to think that we're individual and that we, you know, can all pocket over here can do whatever they want and it's not going to affect a whole pocket over there. And that's just not true. So I think like if you're going to look at it from more of a profound sort of perspective in terms of understanding life and how it all kind of like, you know, interrelates with one another, it, you know, it's, it's the cycle of life is good and bad. You know, we, some some life eats other life and all that kind of stuff but for for life to go to a more complex and more you know advanced stage and whatever the next chapter of for biology is it has to continue working as a, a community um, which is something that probably I think humans are at this stage struggling to do but I you know I'm like I said before I'm a glass half full kind of person and I I do you know I do have hope and I think that's um you know maybe I'm going on too much of a philosophical tangent now no that's what this is here for (laughs) well this is so this you know like um I think that the one really saving grace for humanity or for humans is that we have hope hope is what basically like drives anybody to do anything right the hope to achieve something the hope that they're going to succeed the hope that they're going to get out of a shitty situation um so you know I do I do feel like um, moving forward, uh, you know, and I guess as well, like at this stage, life on this planet. Well, and that actually, I was about to say, humans have such an integral role for what happens to this planet or what happens at least to them on this planet for the future. And the irony is that that has always been the case. So, you know, um, this people always think of life and and actually, this fits into what you were saying before, whether we distinguish life from um, inorganic matter from matter, right? Uh, actually, the two coexist, right? So, Earth is a co-evolving system with life. Um, and it wouldn't be the planet it is today without life. And life wouldn't be what it is today without, you know, the geological and um, other uh, conditions that, that Earth has created. But they are a co-evolving system. And I'll give you an example When life first originated, whenever it did and however it did, it started to change the planet. And at about 2.4 billion years ago, there is this thing called the Great Oxidation Event um, that's in the geological record. It's basically these thick bands of iron oxide. And the theory is that you had oxygen-producing microorganisms that proliferated. They, They, for some reason, like, you know, like an algal bloom, right? You had, like, these big blooms of for uh, probably over millions of years um, of these microorganisms that produced oxygen and they uh, were, because of the oxygen production, essentially oxidized the free iron in the oceans and then that created these iron oxide deposits which we now see in the geological record at 2.4 billion years ago. Now, it was the advent or the evolution of these oxygen producing microorganisms that allowed our atmosphere to become oxygen rich like it is today. And if it wasn't for the oxygen, then life couldn't have become more complex because within our ATP systems, within like more complex life, you need oxygen. So, so we're, actually a, we're actually a product of 
we like human beings are here today because of the little critters that produced oxygen two and a half billion years ago. If they hadn't have done that and hadn't have, have changed the earth, then we wouldn't actually have been able to evolve. Complex life would not have been able to evolve. So it, you know, the, like you said before, this network or this like, you know, there are all these like complex interactions that are occurring and all these things that needed to happen for us to even like kind of get to this point. I'm just sort of trying to think holistically here, you know, in terms of because like life originating is one thing, but like everything that happened between then and now needed to kind of happen in this like beautifully orchestrated way for us to have even have evolved. And on top of that, like you're saying about the oxygenation of the atmosphere, there is like the air that we're breathing is in some sense an artifact. You know, it's something that life produced. It was, you know, you could say an industrial byproduct. And so we, we, what we consider wilderness, what we consider to be sort of this given nature isn't at all. It's the, it's the product of these extremely ancient and complicated interactions between creatures. And so in a way we project our technological metaphors onto the living world by saying the connections between the roots and the mycelial networks underground in a forest is like an internet. It's like, no, 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 no. The internet is like the root work that's going on under the forest. Like that's actually a thing that life has been doing Mm. for hundreds of millions of years. And everything that we're doing, everything that we call artificial is actually an extension of that same natural process and obeying that same set of natural laws or habits, you know? One of the cool things for me about contemplating the ancient microbial world is realizing that everything that we're doing is, I mean, in some ways, no matter how sophisticated it is, is really just sort of reinventing the wheel. And the other part of it is, you, you talk about hope, and I look back on that early world, like the world in which you're finding these these specimens in geyserite, and that was some rough shit. Like <laughs> you're talking like like regular meteoric bombardment. You know, there's like Arthur C. Mm. Clarke's last book. He he kind of raises the question in in a fictional context that you know what if we don't you know the the fossil record of that time is so patchy. Then that we might have lost an entire civilization of like the, you know we don't really know when right. when life started and it could have it could have been that like you know some complex life forms emerged within the first half a billion years on Earth and then we're just wiped out or the rocks are just totally worked over and metamorphosed and we have no idea and it's like the world was so insanely hard back then and yet here we are you know and. So if, if well, yeah, they could a, do it, it we was, can do it. <laughs> well, it was, yeah, exactly. And that, that's a good point. The world was a very different place. It's not the earth that we know it as today. And that, I think that's like a part, that's partly a key to it because, um, you know, we think, well, you know, certainly for a long time um, before all of this scientific endeavor has been able to answer some of those questions. We think we live on earth that has ever been the same but no it's uh, earth was a very very different place billions of years ago and it has ever changed and it will continue to change and you know say human beings continue to um, pump carbon dioxide and all the rest of the things that we're doing to this planet and and it becomes inhospitable for us it will just change and it will just evolve into something else and then potentially some other um complex organism that can speak (laughs) evolves and takes over and will no longer be around i mean there's been plenty of mass extinctions like there's plenty of different ways that we could become extinguished and but the earth will change again and it will just continue on until the solar system dies till the sun gets too big and self-implodes so or maybe we'll get nostalgic and move it (laughs) <laughs> maybe <laughs> well or move us i mean like elon musk i think is at the forefront of thinkers in terms of wanting to get people off this planet and make humans uh, a space-faring species and he has the means to do it potentially so um yeah that could be that 
could be a, a way forward for humans um, if we have enough time, I suppose, before something catastrophic happens. Like humans. <laughs> like humans, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I, you know, and I say all that, I say, you know, um, I guess the way I sound may be a little bit cynical in terms of humans, but, you know, the world or like uh, human beings, it is, it is like a bad, a good versus evil, right? Like it's this like yin yang, this constant like balance of like, good versus evil and I don't, that's the way I see it anyway and there's a lot of good in this world there's a lot of you know like life has um or human beings have strived to do so many amazing things so you know who knows I mean I'd love to be out of appearance for the future like in you know 10,000 years and see what happened to humans because I feel like at this point with the with the technological advancement that we're making in 10,000 years, we probably, you know, given some catastrophic event hasn't occurred, we probably will be a space-faring species. And I would love to be able to look into the future and see what happens to human beings. What do you think is going to happen? Oh, God. You know, I mean, I just, you spend so much time thinking about these don't know. huge frames. Yeah, frames. I do. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I mean, like, yeah, it's, it is a open i mean who can predict something like that you know when you, you all you can really do is and geology's got this term you know the um the present is the key to the past but then like you know in history we sort of go it's the opposite it's like the the past is sort of like helps predict the future and you know i just i have no idea like we can only sort of base on again what we know like we know that there's been five large mass extinctions we we also know that we've never been in contact with any other intelligent life there's a whole bunch of sort of uh, factors that come into play in terms of like what could be limiting for us to carry on forward as a species in the universe, which we haven't even kind of like, you know, there's such a great movie called, it's a cartoon, it's called Horton, Here's a Who. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and there's this little, there's from memory, there's a clip where like they try to get out of the flower and it's like this tiny little ship that like kind of comes out of the flower and then, you know, that's about how far they get. And that's kind of like, you know, that sort of, that emulates for me, I think, sort of where we are right now. Like where we've got these tiny little ships and we're just kind of just just reaching out out of that flower but we haven't really like even entered the world um that is out there <laughs> so you know i don't know i just don't know i mean who can predict like i guess we'll just have more science fiction writers coming up with stories of what's going to happen to humanity in the future and mind you like you look at you know previous science fiction writers like a brave new world and uh oh there's another one there's a, a really good one called um Ready Player One. Oh, yeah. Which is recent about virtual reality. And, like, I love, you know, I really love that concept of, like, it's like, you know, this post apocalyptic world where, like, resources are running out. Somehow we still have virtual reality, but everybody lives in the virtual world because the life outside, like, life on the planet is so crap that nobody wants, like, everybody just lives in a virtual world. Yeah, that was a um, Philip K. Dick. He did that in the, the Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch. Oh, back right. in back in the seventies, he was he was talking about that exact same thing that we we ruin everything with climate change, that we've yeah yeah we've, we've you know it's like you can't go outside anymore, so everyone just plays with the Perky Pat playset, which is like a little Barbie playhouse, and you take drugs, and so you think you're the <laughs> doll, you know, and he he was totally well, predicting yeah. virtual reality. Right, right, right. So and that's and that like I guess that's the answer to my question. All we can really do is kind of like come up with stories and you know see which one comes true <laughs> i guess um but it's yeah who knows i have no idea don't no pick idea. the wrong story <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> but it's interesting to think about well thanks so much for taking the time that's okay it was great getting to know you <laughs> yeah likewise um, likewise no, yeah definitely where can people find your work or connect with you if they want to learn more Probably, oh, sorry, this is, I feel like now is the time where I give my like Facebook name and Twitter account and stuff like that. But I just, I'm so not into social media. Uh -huh. um, I, I'd say the best place to go and look, um, I actually have to think about this because no one's ever asked me that. For shame. Yeah, isn't that shame? Sorry. That um, is a, that's a testament to the depravity of our civilization. <laughs> you should well, be, I just, you should be a rock yeah, star. Like, I mean, 
I mean, yeah, isn't it funny? Like, so, you know, if they, I think if you want to learn more about origins of life stuff and what's at the forefront, I actually would point them towards um, Bruce's, Bruce wrote a paper in a journal called Life. And it's about a field trip he took with me a couple of years ago and his sort of like development of coming up with his concept on origins of life. And I think that's a really good resource to go to. I also think, you know, having a look at the journal paper and that we wrote, which is in Nature Communications, which came out in May this year, um, having a look at that. And if they've got any questions, they can always email me and you can find me online pretty easily. But, you know, uh, I don't know why this is such a hard question for me to answer because I think the field is changing so much in terms of like what we're coming up with as well. Like, and I don't want to just direct people to journal articles either, if that makes any sense. But there is also another book coming out by Martin Van Cranendonk, who's my supervisor, uh, called Earth's Oldest Rocks. And that that's pretty well written for scientists and public alike. And there's going to be a little section there on on the dresser formation and, and our recent findings. So that might be a good place as well to look. I've had people tell me I should probably do a blog, but yeah, I just haven't gone down that route. I feel like I've got so many distractions already. And even though I'm all an advocate for science communication, I, I still don't, you know, like sort of go down those those types of routes myself, which, yeah, anyway. This mm. stuff is just so rich for speculative writing i think and right unless i'm just like dragging you down to a, a pool you don't want to drink from then i think that making yourself known and available for other people who want to cover this stuff is just it's like so vital that yeah that more people yeah. are talking about it more people are writing about it because it really does it changes everything that we think about the world it right. changes the, the whole way we look at everything yeah, it sure does. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah, and I think having these conversations and doing these podcasts and, um, you know, having writing articles and all that kind of stuff really is important for this field. I think science communication is probably one of the most important things of modern society because it is, again, it's like that sort of good versus evil. It's kind of like we're all and, – and also, you know, like what is it, the alternative facts thing and everything that's going on. Oh God. <laughs> like, I mean, it's just like we're living, in a, we're living in a crazy, crazy world where information is – there's too much information and everybody's getting a bit confused about what information they should be um, – taking in or not and in fact um i there's one thing i want to say about science because i've had people say to me that science is also kind of a religion not true not true at all yes maybe you get obsessed with what you're doing but the the key difference and i don't know if you want to put this in your podcast i don't know Go if you want it. me to or not but i'm going to say it anyway the key the difference um <laughs> be between religion and science is that science gives you the information that you can then use to make your own decision Whereas a lot of the time with religion, it's this is kind of the information, take it or leave it. What and, about CERN? You know, what's that? What about CERN? I mean, we're probably what, we're probably getting way too deep here for like the the last two minutes. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But yeah, this totally. this question of like so much of modern science is done with the assistance of artificial intelligence, or is done with equipment that it would be very difficult for somebody to reproduce the findings of an experiment with the Large Hadron Collider. Or even, yeah. in, even in geology and paleontology, right. like because you are sort of at the mercy of erosion and just like what comes out of the ground, it's very mm. difficult to reproduce your well, findings. Is, yeah, totally. Well, it's, but it's based, it's all, I guess it's, it is, you're right, it's based on inter interpretation. But I, think, but I think that's like, in terms of geology, that's true. Um, you know, and in terms of a lot of science um, with, with, yeah, trying to reproduce experiments, that's true. But I think the, the point I'm trying to make is that if you, basically, if you go, if you want to know the answer to something, there is, you know, there's a way that you can sort of go out and seek information and then based on, the, based on that information, you can make a decision for yourself. So mm. it's, it's not going, here's the evidence. I'm telling you, I've got the evidence. You've got to believe me. I'm saying go and find the evidence for yourself or look at the information for yourself and then, and then make a decision for yourself. Because you're, you're allowed to have that decision. Like, I, I'm happy if I show people my evidence and they go, no, I don't agree with it. I go, well, I, you know, I can't, I can't make you, you know, shove my evidence down your throat. I, like, and I think the beauty of science and the beauty of education 
is that you're able to then make decisions and make critical decisions for yourself. And that, to me, is the distinction between, you know, anything else and it not being a religion. It's actually just a way of, you know, it's actually just a way of thinking and going, well, you know, how am I going to live my life? I'm going to find out information. Then I'm going to make a decision for myself, regardless of what other people tell me I should or shouldn't think. But how do we force people to think critically? (laughs) <laughs> well, well, but this is but this is all part of it. It's not about you know. It's not about this is the point. It's not about forcing them to think critically. It's it's. I mean, this is why I think also education, like when we when we send kids into into schools and stuff, it shouldn't be hey, this is what you need to do and what you need to like know and all that kind of stuff. It should be here's information from you know like what we uh, what we know you know and this is how we've sort of deduced it and then you know you allow people to sort of like kind of develop their own thinking skills and if they don't they don't you know like I'm not gonna spend my life sort of trying to convince somebody somebody else that they're better off if they have critical thinking skills um, I guess where that comes into play now is that like if we don't all sort of band together and all become educated and and are able to sort of like make decisions as a group, like we're talking about before in terms of community, then we're all going to fail together. (laughs) So it's not about forcing, it's about working together. And like, you know, I guess the beauty of life is that diversity and that's what what also makes it so difficult um, for us all to get along. (laughs) Um, yeah, that makes any sense whatsoever. It totally does. I guess looking forward into a future where critical thinkers and people who refuse to examine evidence and insist on taking things on the basis of their faith somehow peaceably coexist on the surface of this overpopulated world, all I can really think to say is, let us pray. (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's, that's not that's exactly evidence-based yeah. <laughs> yeah well thanks a lot for having me I appreciate it thanks so much for listening I hope you enjoyed that conversation Future Fossils is part of the Mind Pod Network an amazing collection of podcasts along with Third Eye Drops Synchronicity Podcast It's All Happening The Astral Hustle Be sure to go to mindpodnetwork.com and check it out. And if you'd like to support the show, patreon.com slash Michael Garfield. Thanks again. Until next week.